E.P. Ornis Island by H.G. Wells, narrated by Mike Vendetti. The man with the scarred face leant over the table and looked at my bundle. Orchids? he asked. A few, I said. Cypripedium, he said. Chiefly, said I. Anything new? I thought not. I did these islands twenty-five, twenty-seven years ago. If you find anything new here, well, it's brand new. I didn't leave much. I'm not a collector, said I. I was young then, he went on. Lord, how I used to fly around. He seemed to take my measure. I was in the East Indies two years, and in Brazil seven. Then I went to Madagascar. I know a few explorers by name, I said, anticipating a yarn. Whom did you collect for? Dawson's. I wonder if you've heard the name of Butcher ever. Butcher, Butcher. The name seemed vaguely present in my memory. Then I recalled Butcher versus Dawson. Why, said I. You are the man who sued them for four years' salary and cast away on a desert island. Your servant, said the man with the scar, bowing. Funny case, wasn't it? Here was me making a little fortune on that island, doing nothing for it neither, and them quite unable to give me notice. It often used to amuse me thinking over it while I was there. I did calculations of it, big, all over the blessed tall and ornamental figuring. How did it happen, said I? I don't rightly remember the case. Well, you've heard of the Epionius. Rather, Andrews was telling me of a new species he was working on only a month or so ago, just before I sailed. They've got a thigh bone, it seems nearly a yard long. Monster must have been. I believe you, said the man with the scar. It was a monster. Sinbad's rock was just a legend of him. But when they did find those bones... Three or four years ago. Ninety-one, I fancy. Why? Why? Because I found them. Lord... It was nearly twenty years ago. If Dawson's hadn't been silly about that salary, they might have made a perfect ring in him. I couldn't help the infernal boat going adrift. He paused. I suppose it's the same place, a kind of swamp about ninety miles north of Antananarivo. Do you happen to know? You have to go it along the coast by boats. You don't happen to remember, perhaps? I don't. I fancy Andrew said something about a swamp. It must be the same. It's on the East Coast. And somewhere there's something in the water that keeps things from decaying. Like creosite, it smells. It reminded me of Trinidad. Did they get any more eggs? Some of the eggs I found were a foot and a half long. The swamp goes swirling round, you know, and cuts off this bit. It's mostly salt, too. Well, what a time I had of it. I found the things quite by accident. We went for eggs, me and two native chaps, in one of those rum canoes all tied together, and found the bones at the same time. We had a tent and provisions for four days, and we pitched on one of the firmer places. To think of it brings that ontary smell back even now. It's funny work. You go probing in the mud with iron rod, you know. Usually the egg gets smashed. I wonder how long it is since these epionuses really lived. The missionaries say the natives have legends about when they were alive. But I never heard any such stories myself. But certainly those eggs we got were as fresh as if they had been new laid. Fresh, 
carry him down, down to the boat, one of my chaps dropped one on a rock and it smashed. How I lammed into the beggar. But sweet it was, as if it was new laid, not even smelly, and its mother dead these four hundred years, perhaps, said a centipede had been him. However, I'm getting off the straight with the story. It had taken us all day to dig into the slush and get these eggs out unbroken, and we were all covered with beastly black mud, and naturally I was cross. So far as I knew, they were the only eggs that have ever got out, not even cracked. I went afterwards to see the ones they have at the Natural History Museum in London. All of them were cracked and just stuck together, like a mosaic, and bits missing. Mine were perfect, and I meant to blow them when I got back. Naturally, I was annoyed at the silly duffer dropping three hours' work, just on account of a centipede. I hit him about, rather. The man with the scar took out a clay pipe. I placed my pouch before him. He filled up absent-mindedly. How about the others? Did you get those home? I don't remember. That's the queer part of the story. I had three others. Perfectly fresh eggs. Well, we put them in the boat and then I went up to the tent to make some coffee, leaving my two heathens down by the beach, the one fooling about his sting, the other helping him. It never occurred to me the beggars would take advantage of the peculiar position I was in to pick a quarrel. But I suppose the centipede poison and the kicking I had given him upset the one. He was always a cantankerous sort, and he persuaded the other, I remember I was sitting and smoking and boiling up the water over a spirit lamp business I used to take on these expeditions. Incidentally, I was admiring the swamp under the sunset, all black and blood-red it was, in streaks. A beautiful sight. And up beyond the land rose gray and hazy to the hills, and the sky behind them red, like a furnace mouth and fifty yards behind the back of me was these blessed heathens, quite regardless of the tranquil air of things, plotting to cut off with the boat and leave me all alone with three days' provisions and a canvas tent, and nothing to drink whatsoever beyond a little keg of water. I heard a kind of yelp behind me, and there they were in this canoe affair. It wasn't properly a boat, and perhaps twenty yards from land. I realized what was up in a moment. My gun was in the tent, and besides, I had no bullets, only duck shot. They knew that. But I had a little revolver in my pocket, and I pulled that out as I ran down to the beach. Come back, says I, flourishing it. They jabbered something at me, and the man that broke the egg jeered. I aimed at the other, because he was wounded and had the paddle, and I missed. They laughed. However, I wasn't beat. I knew I had to keep cool, and tried him again, and made him jump with the wang of it. He didn't laugh that time. The third time I got his head, and over he went, and the paddle with him. It was a precious lucky shot for a revolver. I reckon it was fifty yards. He went right under. I don't know if he was shot or simply stunned and drowned. Then I began to shout to the other chap to come back, but he huddled up in the canoe and refused to answer. So I fired out my revolver at him and never got near him. I felt a precious fool, I can tell you. There I was in this rotten black beach, flat swamp all behind me, and flat sea cold after the sunset and just this black canoe drifting steadily out to sea. I tell you, I damn Dawson's and Jamaratches and museums and all the rest of it just to rights. I bawled to this native to come back until my voice went up into a scream. There was nothing for it but to swim after him and take my luck with the sharks. So I opened my clasp knife, 
and put it in my mouth, took off my clothes, and waded in. As soon as I was in the water, I lost sight of the canoe, but I aimed, as I judged, to hit it off. I hoped the man in it was too bad navigated, and it would keep on drifting in the same direction. Presently it came up over the horizon again to the southwestward about. The afterglow of sunset was well over now, and the dim night creeping up. The stars were coming through the blue. I swum like a champion, though my legs and arms were soon aching. However, I came up to him by the time the stars were fairly out. As it got darker, I began to see all manner of glowing things in the water. Phosphorescent, you know. At times it made me giddy. I hardly knew which was stars and which was phosphorescence, and whether I was swimming on my head or my heels. The canoe was as black as sin, and the ripple under the bows like liquid fire. I was naturally cheery of clambering up into it. I was anxious to see what he was up to first. He seemed to be lying cuddled up in a lump in the bows, and the stern was all out of water. The thing kept turning round slowly as it drifted, kind of waltzing, don't you know? I went to the stern and pulled it down, expecting him to wake up. Then I began to clamber in with my knife in my hand, and ready for a rush. But he never stirred. So there I sat, in the stern of the little canoe, drifting away over the calm phosphorescent sea, and with all the host of the stars above me, waiting for something to happen. After a long time I called him by name, but he never answered. I was too tired to take any risk by going along to him. So we sat there. I fancy I dozed once or twice. When the dawn came I saw he was dead as a doornail, and all puffed up and purple. My three eggs and the bones were lying in the middle of the canoe, and the keg of water and some coffee and biscuits wrapped in a Cape Argus ice feet, and a tin of methylate spirit underneath him. There was no paddle, nor in fact anything except a spirit tin that I could use as one, so I settled to drift until I was picked up. I held an inquest on him, brought in a verdict against some snake, scorpion, or centipede unknown, and sent him overboard. After that, I had a drink of water and a few biscuits, and took a look around. Suppose a man, low down as I was, don't see very far lest ways. Madagascar was clean out of sight, and any trace of land at all. I saw a sail go south-westward. Looked like a schooner, but her hull never came up. Presently, the sun got high in the sky and began to beat down upon me. Lord! It pretty near made my brains boil. I tried dipping my head in the sea, but after a while my eye fell on the Cape Argus, and I lay down flat in the canoe and spread this over me. Wonderful thing, these newspapers. I never read one through thoroughly before, but it's odd what you get to when you're alone, as I was. I suppose I read that blessed old Cape Argus twenty times. The pitch in the canoe simply reeked with the heat and rose up into big blisters. I drifted ten days, said the man with the scar. It's a little thing in the telling, isn't it? Every day was like the last, except in the morning and the evening. I never kept a lookout even. The blaze was so infernal. I didn't see a sail after the first three days and those I saw took no notice of me. About the sixth night a ship went by scarcely half a mile away from me, with all its lights ablaze and its ports open, looking like a big firefly. There was music aboard. I stood up and shouted and screamed at it. The second day I broached one of the Epiornis eggs, scraped the shell away at the end bit by bit, and tried it and I was glad to find it was good enough to eat. A bit flavory, 
Not bad. I mean, but with something of the taste of a duck eggs. There was a kind of circular patch about six inches across on one side of the yolk, and with streaks of blood and a white mark, like a ladder in it, that I thought queer. But I did not understand what it, this meant at the time, and I wasn't inclined to be particular. The egg lasted me three days with biscuits and a drink of water. I chewed coffee berries, too. Invigorating stuff. The second egg I opened about the eighth day, and it scared me. The man with the scar paused. Yes, he said, developing. I dare say you find it hard to believe I did with the thing before me. There the egg had been sunk in that cold black mud, perhaps three hundred years, but there was no mistaking it. There was the, what is it, embryo, with its big head and curved back and its heart beating under its throat, and the yolk shriveled up and great membranes spreading inside the shell and all over the yolk. Here was I hatching out the legs of the biggest of all extinct birds, in a little canoe in the midst of the Indian Ocean. Fool Dawson had known that. It was worth four years' salary. What do you think? However, I had to eat that precious thing up, every bit of it, before I sighted the reef, and some of the mouthfuls were beastly unpleasant. I left the third one alone. I held it up to the light, but the shell was too thick for me to get any notion of what might be happening inside. And though I fastened, I heard blood pulsing. It might have been the rustle in my own ears, like what you listen to in a seashell. Then came the atoll, came out of the sunrise, as it were, suddenly close up to me. I drifted straight towards it until I was about half a mile from shore, not more. And then the current took a turn, and I had to paddle as hard as I could with my hands and bits of the Epiorna shell to make the place. However, I got there. It was just a common atoll, about four miles round, with a few trees growing and a spring in one place, and the lagoon full of parrotfish. Took the egg ashore and put it in a good place, well above the tide lines and in the sun, to give it all the chance I could, and pulled the canoe up chafed, and loafed about prospecting. It's rum how dull and it all is. As soon as I had found a spring, all the interest seemed to vanish. When I was a kid, I thought nothing could be finer or more adventurous than the Robinson Crusoe business, but that place was as monotonous as a book of sermons. I went round finding edible things and generally thinking, but I tell you I was bored to death before the first day was out. Shows my luck. The very day I landed, the weather changed. A thunderstorm went by to the north and flicked its wing over the island, and in the night there came a drencher and a howling wind slapped over us. It wouldn't have taken much, you know, to upset the canoe. I was sleeping under the canoe, and the egg, luckily, among the sand higher up the beach. And the first thing I remember was a sound, like a hundred pebbles hitting the boat at once, and a rush of water over my body. I'd been dreaming of Anton on the Rio, and I sat up and hallowed to Antoshi to ask her what the devil was up, and clawed out at the chair where the matches used to be. Then I remembered where I was. There were phosphorescent waves rolling up as they meant to eat me, and all the rest of the night as black as pitch. The air was simply yelling. The clouds seemed down on your head almost, and the rain fell as if heaven was sinking, and they were bailing out the waters above the firmament. One great roar came writhing at me, like a fiery serpent, and I bolted. Then I thought of the canoe and ran down to it as the water went hissing back again. But the thing had gone. 
I wondered about the egg then, and felt my way to it. It was all right, and well out of reach of the maddest waves. So I sat down beside it and cuddled it for company. Lord, what a night that was! The storm was over before the morning. There wasn't a rag of cloud left in the sky when the dawn came, and all along the beach there were bits of plank scattered, which was the disarticulated skeleton, so to speak, of my canoe. However, that gave me something to do, for taking advantage of two of the trees being together, I rigged up a kind of storm shelter with these vestiges. And that day the egg hatched. Hatched, sir, when my head was pillowed on it and I was asleep. I heard a whack, felt a jar and sat up, and there was the end of the egg pecked out and a rum little brown head looking at me. Lord, I said, you're welcome, and with a little difficulty he came out. He was a nice friendly little chap at first, about the size of a small hen, very much like most other young birds, only bigger. His plumage was a dirty brown to begin with, with a sort of gray scab that fell off it very soon, and scarcely feathers, kind of downy hair. I can hardly express how pleased I was to see him. I tell you, Robinson Clarusso didn't make near enough of his loneliness. But here was interesting company. He looked at me and winked his eye from the front backwards, like a hen, and gave a chirp and began to peck about at once, as though being hatched three hundred years too late was just nothing. Glad to see you, man, Friday, says I for I had naturally settled he was to be called Man Friday, if ever he was hatched, as soon as ever. I found the egg in the canoe had developed. I was a bit anxious about his feed, so I gave him a lump of raw parrotfish at once, he took it, and opened his beak for more. I was glad of that, for under the circumstances, if he'd been at all fanciful, I should have had to eat him after all. You'd be surprised what an interesting bird that Epionis chick was. He followed me about from the very beginning. He used to stand by me and watch while I fished in the lagoon and go shares in anything I caught. He was sensible, too. There were nasty green warty things like pick gherkins used to lie about the beach, and he tried one of these and it upset him. He never looked at any of them again and he grew. You could almost see him grow, and as I was never much of a society man, his quiet, friendly ways suited me to a T. For nearly two years we were as happy as we could be on that island. I had no business worries, for I knew my salary was mounting up at Dawson's. We would see a sail now and then, but nothing ever came near us. I amused myself, too, by decoding the island with designs worked in sea urchins and fancy shells of various kinds. I put Epiornius Island all round the place very nearly in big letters, like what you see done with colored stones at railway stations in the old country, and mathematical calculations and drawings of various sorts. And I used to lie watching the blessed birds stalking about and growing, growing, and think how I could make a living out of him by showing him about if I ever got taken off. After his first molt he began to get handsome, with a crest and a blue wattle, and a lot of green feathers at the behind of him, and then I used to puzzle whether Dawson's had any right to claim him or not. Stormy weather and in the rainy season we lay snug under the shelter. I'd made out of the old canoe, and I used to tell him lies about my friends at home, and after a storm we would go round the island together to see if there was any drift. It was a kind of idol, you might say. If only I had some tobacco, it would have been simply just like heaven. It was about the end of the second year our little paradise went wrong. 
Friday was then about fourteen feet high to the bill of him, with a big broad head like the end of a pickaxe, and two huge brown eyes with yellow rims, set together like a man's, not out of sight of each other like a hen's. His plumage was fine, none of the half-mourning style of your ostrich, more like a cassowary as far as color and texture go. And then it was he began to cock his comb at me and give himself errors and show signs of a nasty temper. At last came a time when my fishing had been rather unlucky, and he began to hang about me in a queer meditative way. I thought he might have been eating sea cucumbers or something, but it was really just discontent on his part. I was hungry, too, and when at last I landed a fish, I wanted it for myself. Tempers were short that morning on both sides. He pecked at it and grabbed it, and I gave him a whack on the head to make him leave go. And at that, he went for me. Lord! He gave me this in the face. The man indicated a scar. Then he kicked me. It was like a cart horse. I got up and seeing he hadn't finished, I started off full tilt with my arms doubled up over my face. But he ran on those gawky legs of his faster than a racehorse and kept landing out at me with sledgehammer kicks and bringing his pickaxe down on the back of my head. I made for the lagoon and went up to my neck. He stopped at the water, for he hated getting his feet wet, and began to make a shindy, something like a peacock's, only hoarser. He started strutting up and down the beach. I'll admit I felt small to see this blessed fossil lording it there, and my head and face were all bleeding, and, well, my body, just one jelly of bruises. I decided to swim across the lagoon and leave him alone for a bit, until the affair blew over. I shinned up the tallest palm tree and sat there thinking of it all. I don't suppose I ever felt so hurt by anything before or since. It was the brutal ingratitude of the creature. I'd been more than a brother to him. I'd hatched him, educated him, a great gawky out-of-date bird and me a human being, heir of the ages, and all that. Thought after a time he'd begin to see things in that light himself, and feel a little sorry for his behavior. I thought if I was to catch some nice little bits of fish, perhaps, and go to him presently in a casual kind of way, and offer them to him, he might do the sensible thing. It took me some time to learn how unforgiving and cantankerous, an extinct bird can be. Malice. I won't tell you all the little devices I tried to get that bird round again. I simply can't. It makes my cheek burn with shame, even now, to think of the snubs and buffets I had from this infernal curiosity. I tried violence. I chucked lumps of coral at him from a safe distance, but he only swallowed them. I shied my open knife at him and almost lost it, though it was too big for him to swallow. I tried starving him out and struck fishing, but he took to picking along the beach at low water after worms and rubbed along on that. Half my time I spent up to my neck in the lagoon and the rest up the palm trees. One of them was scarcely high enough, and when he caught me up it, he had a regular bank holiday with the calves of my legs. Got unbearable. I don't know if you have ever tried sleeping up a palm tree. It gave me the most horrible nightmares. Think of the shame of it, too. Here was this extinct animal, mooning about my island like a sulky duke. And me not allowed to rest the sole of my foot on the place. I used to cry with weariness and vexation. I told him straight that I didn't mean to be chased about a desert island by any damned anachronism. Told him to go and peck a navigator of his own age. But he only snapped his beak at me, 
great ugly bird, all legs and neck. I shouldn't like to say how long that went on altogether. I'd have killed him sooner if I'd known how. However, I hit on a way of settling him at last. It's a South American dodge. I joined all my fishing lines together with stems of seaweed and things, and made a stoutish string, perhaps twelve yards in length or more, and I fastened two lumps of coral rock to the ends of this. It took me some time to do, because every now and then I had to go into the lagoon or up a tree as the fancy took me. This I whirled rapidly round my head, and then let it go at him. The first time I missed, but the next time the string caught him beautifully and wrapped round them again and again. Over he went. I threw it standing waist deep in the lagoon, and soon as he went down I was out of the water and sawing his neck with my knife. I don't like to think of that even now. I felt like a murderer while I did it, though my anger was hot against him. When I stood over him, I saw him bleeding on the white sand, and his beautiful great legs and neck writhing in his last agony. Pah! With that tragedy, loneliness came upon me like a curse. Good Lord! You can't imagine how I missed that bird. I sat by his corpse and sorrowed over him, and shivered as I looked round the desolate, silent reef. I thought of what a jolly little bird he had been when he was hatched, and of a thousand pleasant tricks he had played before he went wrong. I thought if I'd only wounded him, I might have nursed him round into a better understanding. If I'd had any means of digging into the coral rock, I'd have buried him. I felt exactly as if he was human. As it was, I couldn't think of eating him. So I put him in the lagoon, and the little fishes picked him clean. I didn't even save the feathers. Then one day a chap, cruising about in a yacht, had a fancy to see if Mighty Toll still existed. He didn't come a moment too soon, for I was about sick enough of the desolation of it, and only hesitating whether I should walk out into the sea and finish up the business that way or fall back on the green things. I sold the bones to a man named Winslow, a dealer near the British Museum, and he says he sold them to old Havers. Seems Havers didn't understand they were extra large, and it was only after his death they attracted attention. They called them Epiornises. What was it? Epiornis Vastus, said I. It's funny. The very thing was mentioned to me by a friend of mine when they found an epiornis with a thigh a yard long. They thought they had reached the top of the scale and called him Epiornis Maximus. Then someone turned up another thigh bone, four feet six or more, and that they called Epiornis Titan. Then your vastus was found after old Havens died in his collection. And then a vastimus turned up. Winslow was telling me as much, said the man with the scar. If they get any more epiornuses, he reckons some scientific swell will go and burst a blood vessel. But it was a queer thing to happen to a man, wasn't it, altogether? This has been E.P. Ornis Island by H.G. Wells, narrated by Mike Vendetti. Production copyright 2024 by Mike Vendetti Productions, www.mikevendetti.com.